This podcast is created on Treaty 8 territory, the ancestral and present-day home to the many diverse First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. We honor the original caretakers of this land, the history, and the opportunity to walk together in friendship, truth, and reconciliation. Just want to uplift you, spread love and positivity. Yeah, everybody tune in the carriage on speaks. Yeah, uh, want to share light uh-huh. on the extraordinary. Okay, sharing people's stories from struggling to glory. Yeah. It's all about empowerment, the coolest channel you're gonna find. Trying to make the world better one step at a time. Let's go. Carriage Jones, Carriage Jones speaks. Yeah, Carriage Jones. I met Brett English as part of the Bay of Guscon podcast initiative, which I was lucky enough to facilitate from 2022 to 23 with the Grand Prairie Friendship Center. The program brought together high school students and post-secondary students from diverse cultures and backgrounds to learn the art of podcasting, collaboration, and the power of storytelling to address complex social issues such as racism, discrimination, truth, and reconciliation. Brett loves to share his passion for history and the world wars. So when I saw the Vimy Foundation had a scholarship for youth in Canada to apply to go overseas and to learn about how Canada contributed to World War I, I knew Brett was a shoe in So we joined forces and he created a video and an essay and he won. So I am beyond excited to learn about his journey to France and Belgium. Hey, Brett. Hello. Oh, my God. I am so excited to interview you. I can't believe you got to go to Europe. Like, that's awesome. I mean, you just have to tell me all about it. Just start from the beginning. It was amazing. When you told me about it, it was, I couldn't believe it. At first, when I told people, everyone was like, Brett, what if it's a uh, April Fool's prank? What if that was it? I was going to say, ever do that to you? (laughs) I I would be very disappointed if it was an April Fool's prank telling them hey get your passports in get all this stuff ready you're going to europe and just for them like yo april fools just kidding especially after all that work we did on the essay yeah (laughs) Yeah, i'm like april fools i'll say (laughs) but yeah it was really nice i met new people the people there were phenomenal the um, the people who were in charge they were also phenomenal and the whole experience was just amazing going being me yeah. And going to a different country for the first time, it's incredible because none of my um, like family members has ever gone that far. Really? Yeah. I, my mother told me that I'm the first one to go that far. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. And how was uh, the food? That's what people always ask about when they go. <laughs> food. I miss the cheese. I may be lactose intolerant, but the cheese there... It was amazing. That's the one thing I miss. Oh my gosh. But there was baguettes everywhere I went. Yeah. There was baguettes in stores. There were baguettes in the market. France had a lot of baguettes. Amazing. And sadly, I, was, I wasn't I was able to try uh, Belgium waffles. Ah. Oh, well. Yeah. But. My card wasn't working, so. <laughs> oh, no. I'm going to go there again this see. Well, listen, tell me a little bit about, okay, so let's tell everybody a little bit about why you were there. Why I was there? Well, because of you. Oh, well, no, not because of me. (laughs) Well, technically. But what was the purpose of going? The purpose of going to, like, joining in the Vimy Foundation was that you got to learn about a war that doesn't really get talked about that much. You see a lot of films talking about Vietnam, the, uh, the, the Second World War, but not that many talking about the First World War. And even the people in charge are like, hey, not that many people talk about this. And it's kind of scarce because lots of men and soldiers have PTSD from it and they've lost their lives. lives. And just like learning about it more and getting more in depth, you start realizing what it actually was like wow. to be there. Did you, were there many other indigenous youth there? Actually, yes. Well, there was uh, another indigenous youth, and um, she did her soldier, also an indigenous soldier, mm-hmm. which I also did one. What, but, what's that, sorry? Uh, what? What did you say? A soldier? You did a soldier? Yes. What's we that? had to write about a soldier and like get to talk about the soldier. Oh. Yes. Uh, and I got to do a soldier from the Mohawk, 
Okay. And she did one from Sisica, which is really funny because my mom is from Sisica. Yeah. So yeah, and we burnt. I burnt some sage for the fallen soldier. Wow. So hopefully that his spirit finds peace. That's amazing. I'm so. And how many other people were there with you? I believe twenty or twenty one. Okay. The number has sadly dropped due to not that much funding, mm. which is really sad because they had to let go of one of the best guy- people I've ever met. Um, I, yeah, his name is Tom, mm-hmm. and I actually loved meeting Tom. Tom was the best, but sadly they had to let it go. They let him go, and sadly some people may not be able to have the same experience because they are limiting how many people can go due to how much funding they are getting because not that much people are funding it which is really sad because mm-hmm. lots of people lost their lives during this war and we actually get to experience like we got to explore the trenches and see them all the graves wow. so it just took a really big toll and it makes you really think about what this war actually was about did you go to flanders field Actually, yes, we did go to Flanders Field, and I believe we also went to, there's a memorial with the guy who wrote Flanders Field. Wow. Yeah. I just remembered that right now. It's like, (laughs) oh, yeah, Flanders Field. Yeah. You know, we always read that in school. Yeah. when When you look more deeply into the poem, you see, like, when we more, like, picked at it more, then you really see what these, what the soldier was saying. And like everything turns out, it was a poem about, I believe, his friend who he lost during the First World War. And he also lost his horse. Oh. Yeah. Which, it must have been so hard. I can't. It was. It was really hard. It was really emotional because soldiers would write letters to their loved ones back here and saying, oh, yeah, I can't wait to come home. I can't wait to see you once I get home. And then once he realized, yeah, we see his grave, we already know, oh, he never made it home. And some of those soldiers are still not there. And a lot of them, a lot of the graves were unmarked graves. Nobody knew because they were so dismembered during the First World War Mm -hmm. due to how intense it was that some of the graves, they don't even know the names of the soldier. That's so sad. It is really sad. Does it make you have a different appreciation for some of the wars we're watching unfold right now? Like, what do you mean? I mean, like, what's happening in Ukraine and what's happening in Palestine and things like that. Having gone and actually, like, it's gone through the, see the history of it. It feels like, it just feels devastating because, like, these wars seem kind of unnecessary. Yeah. Like, although they are fighting for freedom, it's just sad to see so many die and still to this day, so many die. Yeah. And especially war is terrible. It really is. Yeah. When I went to Ethiopia, I remember realizing how young Canada felt uh, when I saw things in the museum that were like, I don't know, 3000 BC or something. I'm like, before Christ. (laughs) (laughs) You just realize, I mean, I realize Canada is not a young country, but as a colonized country, you know, it's not... um, it's not very old. Did you have that sense when you went over to yes. here and you're like, whoa, this is so old? Yeah, like there was bunkers and there was giant castles. And I was like, oh my goodness. This we actually got to climb up this giant castle, right? Wow. And we got to see the, the tippy top of it. And the stairs were small, like a child could step on them, which you could see, like they used to be really small back then, right? Yeah. So that would make sense. Because, like, they were small steps. This, like, they were really small. <laughs> I almost tripped on them twice. I almost fell down the stairs. And me and my friends were like, I hope we don't fall down these stairs. They were like, nah, you, you won't fall down the stairs. Just grab onto the railing. Luckily, there was a railing. I know it's a lot because you can learn so much in a week and a half or however long you were gone. And But was there something that stood out for you that you learned that you were like... Oh my God, like it changed you? Um, it has to be the letters. Yeah? The, the letters that they wrote to each other, seeing all those graves, just knowing that one person can change the whole outcome of your whole entire life. 
just because of geopolitics. Wow. Which before that I was, you know, war movies, they put you into the hope and the thought that you could be a war hero. But movies like All Choir on the Western Front in like um, 1917, I believe it is, they show you what actually war is like and like how devastating it is. And I love how those ones actually like portray them as like horrifying and you don't be praised as a war hero just going in. And that war is just terrible because you're killing another human. Just it's terrifying to think of that. Yeah. Some people say that they have a stomach for it. Uh, I don't think so. No, no, no. I remember um, I was just thinking like, and you just never know, you know, who you're fighting on the other side. Yeah. It's like, you don't know they could have a family and you're just taking away them from their family. Just to think of that, that just devastates me to think that all these soldiers never came home back to their wives, their their children. And because of back then when women weren't like respected that much, it was probably hard for them being a single mother trying to raise a bunch of children yes. after losing their father. Did you learn more about um, how Indigenous Canadians played a part in World War One? A hundred percent. I le- tell me, I want to learn more. I learned um, a bit more doing more research into it, and the stories that were told, like such as um, that, like once they got back, they lost a bunch of land. Because I remember a lot of social teachers telling me. Oh well, yeah, once they got back after the war, they got land. They never got land. Mm-hmm. And a lot of land was stolen from them. And they were actually told that they weren't indigenous anymore and lost their status due to not being on the reserves. And it's really devastating because if you think about it, they tried fighting for freedom and they wouldn't get their freedom until a long, long time. Yeah. A long time. <laughs> long time. Yeah. Yeah, you I've learned a lot from this trip. A lot of stuff that now looking back at it, I think I've learned more going on this trip than actually in the classroom. Yeah. Cause the classroom doesn't really talk about that much stuff. They usually glance over the first world war and then just move straight to the second world war because that's everybody knows that. But the first world war is it's really in depth and I really enjoy it, like learning mm-hmm. about it. Yeah, I can imagine because I remember even learning more about, you know, Canada's contribution to the First World War and seeing in, in Nova Scotia, like during that time, like um, when soldiers were coming home and and the shell shock, they called yeah. it, right? And just not understanding. And I think that upon reflection, it's just, you know... When you were traveling to Belgium, what exactly happened when you were in Belgium? Like, why did you go there? Uh, we went there to go see this monument in um, the Flemish part of Belgium. And it was, but it turns out it was under construction. Oh. But luckily they put down this tarp to like show it. But we went to go see uh, Indian memorial. Mm-hmm. Not, not indigenous Indian, but like, um, you know, Middle yeah. Eastern Indian. Yeah, we went to go see uh, the memorial for them, mm-hmm. and it was, they have this, um, I don't know what it's called, but it's like this three-headed line thing, and it's on the currency, Yeah, but it, there's, a jo- there's a statue of it right there, and it's really amazing, and it shows actually a picture of what it was like when the war started, like before the war started, and after the war started, like the ground was devastated and the whole city was like in ruins. Wow. And some of it still is still there. If you were to give advice to any young high school students who might second guess applying for a scholarship like this, what would you tell them now that you've been there? You may be a bit nervous once you like, you know, you're going far from home. You're going to get nervous, but It's the best experience I've ever felt and I've ever been on. And everyone that I met there was amazing. They were nice. 
they were compassionate. They actually understood there was, we were all different. We were like, all of us were different. No one was basically the same. And we all had our uniqueness in the way we all came from different parts of Canada, had different backgrounds. It was incredible. And it sort of felt like we were sort of like the soldiers because we were going far from home. But instead of, as I said in um, the thing that we wrote, mm-hmm. instead of bringing our um, guns to fight, we learned about the fight. Mm-hmm. To prevent the fight. To prevent the fight. <laughs> in future. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. And I think that I just have to say, I was so excited that you got to go because you were always such a, since I met you, you've been obsessed with history. I have. It's any history nerd out there. Join Vimy. It's amazing. It was fantastic. Tell me a little bit about what you were saying about the front lines, because you showed me some footage of how close the front lines are. Who was it in the The, front lines? The front lines um, during the first stages of the war, it was hardcore veterans and mostly like people that knew how to fight. During the war, more and more people were conscripted into fighting for each side. And so because there was new recruits, they weren't as tough and like they were tough, but like they were still sort of civilians because they didn't get that much training. So they were pretty like they did not want to kill. So they would pretty be buddy and buddies and buddies with the Germans or the Americans or whoever else the British, the French, all of them, they were pretty buddies with buddies with these guys. And they would actually toss over food saying, asking, Hey, basically go like, what are you eating tonight? Well, I don't want to see what you're eating. That's basically ha- why the Christmas truce also broke out. And was because all these guys, they just wanted to go home. They said that the war will be over quick and they just wanted to go home. So then once they, once the Christmas truce broke out, then everyone was buddies with buddies. Of course, there was some regions where people were still fighting, but you see all these glimpses of war where it still shows the human side of what we deem as like killers. Yeah. Well, they had no choice. Yeah. They, they had to. They didn't have no choice. Yeah. They would actually, there would actually be some um RCMP officers that would come onto reservations and force indigenous people to go fight and actually they told us a story that a bunch of indigenous people would just run into the woods and just go hide whenever they saw the RCMP officers come in well that makes sense too and little did they know what was going to happen after they yeah were forced <laughs> to yeah fight for a country that never fought for them so what other stories did you hear that you were like, that's amazing? Um, one of the stories, uh, there was this boy who was enlisted. Well, he wasn't enlisted. He wanted to join up. And he wrote that he was, I believe, 19. He said he was older. But really, he was 15 years old. And the officer he would say where's your id where's all this right he didn't say so and he just let him join in and when he was actually in the trenches and they were beginning to go over the front like over through the um, no man's land to begin the charge he said i'm not actually 15 to a soldier he said i'm not actually this old i i'm actually only 15 i want to get out of here i want to still see my mom and he said too late now yeah and he sadly died during that war that's so sad. It is really sad. It's There's, like the patriotic, you know, yeah, propaganda. Propaganda goes a whole way in fueling war. It's it goes a whole way because like all quiet on the western front. I the reason why I always go back to this movie it's because it goes such a great portrayal on how the war was, and it was actually sort of like that. Actually, the um, person who was giving us a tour of the German grave. Um, They said it was actually like that. Young men would be pressured into joining in the German army to go fight when they were not really comfort. Like, they didn't want to do it. They were more pressured in by their friends to go do it. And 
if they weren't, if they didn't join, then you would be the outcast. The traitor, the coward. Yeah. And it was so different back then. Like that's like, like you would be, your life would be ruined if you had that label. Yeah. And some soldiers who did like retreat or like run away, they were actually shot and executed and they were not given a grave, which was really sad. They were not like remembered. I remember I interviewed this man once and he was a Vietnam veteran and he talked about when he was in New York. And he remembered how naive he was. And he was so young. I think he was 17. And all of his friends are like, yeah, let's go do this. Let's yeah. go to the war. And it was that feeling of like, let's do this. The but patriot. yeah, the patriotic like feeling. And he said it was a big mistake. Yeah. He's, it was not what I thought. And War is usually not as some people think. It's usually much more terrible and disgusting. I don't think anything would be good about war. I don't. I think everyone pretty much thinks war is probably awful. But there are some people that are a bit naive, thinking that, oh, I'm fighting for my land, when really, land was just giving us to God. Mm -hmm. Like, not to be, not to go into they or that type of death, but like, borders are just drawn on paper. They're not real. That I always bring this up. Borders are not real, and. Although you do have your culture, we were all given this earth to live and be buddies and buddies with each other. But but governments decide to draw borders, make disputes, dictate how who goes fight and how they dictate a lot. And I just feel like the government does not really care about us that much, more about if they get paid. Yeah. It's eye-opening, isn't it? It is really eye-opening. Mm -hmm. I don't care if Justin Trudeau sends the RCMP after me again. Not again. Yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> they sent they sent the off out uh, they sent uh they sent them to my people once. Yeah. I'm like, what happened? But you're gonna call me this after the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I would risk by the RCMP for being native. <laughs> but like that's not even like that's a sad yeah. truth yeah it was right? it was a sad truth which some people glance over especially the school system which i absolutely hate they just go like oh yeah we did that once all right moving on yeah because the school system they don't really talk about what they have done and still to this day a lot of indigenous people are suffering from that and they just think oh it's because of you're not focused you're not doing all this when really it's because of them that some indigenous students are failing their grades. It's because of school and the residential school system that a bunch of indigenous people are hurt and that, yeah, they are abused. It's because of the residential school system. And they don't look at that. They just look at, oh, they're a druggie or they're a drinker. Yeah, I think that a lot more people are waking up to the truth. I have friends who are immigrants that just, they're refugees, actually. They came here um, a year ago, a little over a year ago. Um, and they are feeling a little bit like they were lied to. 100%. About Canada. They're yeah. like, um... You know, the U.S. and Canada always do this lie. I Okay, not to, not to sound a bit weird, but um, there's this one game. And it's one of these GTA games, and yeah. it sort of ties in with sort of that feeling. It's uh, it felt, I forget which one it was, but it's with uh, Niko Bellic, mm -hmm. this uh, Serbian character who who gets told that America's this promised land, this promised land of dreams and opportunities. Once he gets there, it's not, mm -hmm. and it's terrible. Which I yeah, it's just terrible. I mean, because they and their family often thinks, well, you're in Canada now, you must have lots of money. Yeah. But, you know, you're working four or five jobs at minimum wage. And you can't pay and you can't even get food. Yeah. And a lot of these people have that come here or have like serious degrees, some of them, you know, yeah. and they can't even use it. And so I think now with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, 
my friends who moved here, they were appalled when they found out what the government did to the Indigenous people of this land. And they were like, how could we never be taught this? I said, we were never taught it. Yeah. Like the last school closed when I graduated high school. Yeah. That's it's gross. It's like, what? And a lot of people glance over this, but the queen was alive during all that. Oh, yeah. She could have done something about it, but she didn't really. Also, if the Canadian government was sorry about what they have done, why don't they improve reservations? Yeah. I know. Because I visited several reservations and it's they tell i've been told that they don't get that much funding by the government and everyone always thinks oh yeah it's so great to be a native when really you have to deal with racism you have to deal with being called a girl because just because of your culture and because of your long hair because our culture is to grow your hair for strength a bunch of young warriors get told that they're girls and they get humiliated yet they don't really talk about that that much. Yeah. And it's sad to see a bunch of even my own brothers and cousins, to see them cut their hair due to not the parents not telling them about why we do this and not having like some respect because they wouldn't be here if we were here. Mm-hmm. I think too, I mean, you've always, you, you've you been dancing since you were a kid, right? Yes. And... You know, I think your family has been really um, leaders in this community and surrounding areas and and people feeling strong about their culture and learning their culture. And, you know, uh, your grandmother as your nama. (laughs) Remember that story she told, you know, about how like she would get all the kids um, on the kids would be all these different nations of kids like um redheads and like um yeah filipino and like all these people and she'd like get them all dressed up in regalia and like have them just go to the dance yeah. <laughs> and i'm like that's awesome right yeah. but i think that shame component that i hear a lot of my indigenous friends talk about is yeah. that they don't know how to um broach that or like bridge the relationship between what's been taken from them and where they come from in their culture yeah you know but it shouldn't it shouldn't be like that shame alone is awful it is really awful that's that's why i like dancing is because i'm i always get told brett you you really inspire me to keep dancing you really inspire me to dance some more and i'm just proud to hear that because our culture is um, is precious. It is. And it's sort of dying due to the, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but like white culture. No, mixed, white supremacy. White, yeah, the white supremacy <laughs> coming in and just blocking out that traditional values and their teachings. Yeah, and the colonization of, but you know, I will say from what I've I've heard a lot of Indigenous people talk about this, which I love. It didn't work. Yeah. It Thank didn't work. God. Thank God it didn't work. Yeah. I, I was talking to my wife. And creator. Uh, yeah. I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was talking to my wife and he was like, Brad, your back's so good. He's like, it tastes so good. I was like, yeah, you guys are lucky you didn't get rid of us. Oh my God. <laughs> my friend Art always says, I don't know. I said, do you know this guy? And he, I said, it's a it's a white guy. And he's like, oh, they all look the same. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Let's laugh. So great. Oh my god! But I think that you know, there. I do feel a shift happening. Yeah, 100%. I feel like the truth is starting to come out, and I think a lot of it is in your generation and the generations after you. Um, by you dancing and you taking part in things like this and all the stuff you share. Yeah. It inspires like the young and look at all the siblings you have. You have a lot of siblings. I do. I do. <laughs> To many. You're you're a great big brother though. <laughs> like it's awesome. I think it's great though because where you you know, when we were talking about it in that opening video, not even people didn't even know that about indigenous soldiers. Yeah. You a lot know? Of people did not know. And now they're learning and yeah, they're like, Whoa, I can't believe that happened. Be like 
Wait until you learn about residential schools. Yeah. A lot of my friends didn't even know what a residential school was in 2018. They didn't know because, and I told them, I said, the reason you don't know is, well, yeah, and we weren't taught it. And also, even though it's spoken about on TV, if you hear it, a lot of them thought it was a boarding school. They didn't understand, like, what happened. Yeah, the, yeah, I realized that, um... With the whole residential school stuff like they usually try to shut it down like not talk about it that much because they don't talk of canada never talks about what they have done because also tying it back to the first world war they committed several war crimes in the first world war mm-hmm. and canada doesn't really talk about that canada committed world war crimes yes they a story that was told is they would throw over two cans of food, then they'd throw over a live grenade oh. to gain their trust, then blow them up and kill them. Oh, my God. Yeah. That's, I've also, I don't know if it's true, but I've heard that the reason why Geneva Convention, the whole thing started, was because of Canadians. Hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what? That's, uh, I'm glad I got you interviewed again. Yes. <laughs> I got you back on camera because I'm like. Brad, these are really good stories. We're going back on camera. Natives have pretty good stories. <laughs> Natives and just you in general. Yeah. <laughs> you have some good stories. I do. I do. I've been my grandmother whenever we go on a road trip. She's like, Brett, tell me one of your stories. Oh my gosh. One time when we went on a trip, your grandmother says to me, do you relate to Brett? And the way she <laughs> said it was so funny. I think she was trying to figure out my neural spices. Uh. Uh, that makes sense. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, why? <laughs> it's yeah. so funny. <laughs> I, I would joke around with my friends. Uh, the teacher, uh, this one time, he was talking about the spectrum on like science. So he was like, I want a spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I'm on a few different spectrums. <laughs> the rainbow spectrum, the neuro spectrum. <laughs> the I galaxy spectrum. There we go. I didn't tell you this, but I'm not going to include this in the podcast, but I'm actually an alien. By the way, I'm an interdimensional being. <laughs> Go away.